thanks for having me this afternoon. So Montage Gold. Um, Montage is a relatively new story. We IPO'd in October in, on the TSX um, and raising some money to sort of progress the, the Kone Gold project. Uh, but it's also quite an old story. So this, the management and the actual asset of Kone date back to a company called Redback Mining, which was very successful in West Africa and Ghana at the Chirana Gold Mine and in Tarsias in Mauritania. Um, eventually sold to Kinross Gold Corp for uh, a significant amount of money back in 2010. So this asset goes back to that time and um, to the Redback time. I pegged this ground. I used to run exploration for Redback um, for a long period between 2003 and 2010. But also the management of Redback is heavily involved in this company. So Montage really is a company that, that knows West Africa well, has had success in West Africa. And really, we're trying to replicate that success uh, with Montage. We're focused in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, for me, it's the most prospective company, country in West Africa. Um, we have a strong backing from the likes of the Lucas Lundin and his family, Ross Beatty. We have Sandstorm Gold royalties on the register. We all have put money in into multiple rounds. And most importantly, we have a significant asset, the Kone project. Um, we are moving it very quickly. Um, we IPO'd in October 2020. Uh, at the time, it had held a 1.5 million ounce resource, an inferred resource. We've since that time, we've drilled aggressively, we've expanded that resource, we've converted it from inferred to indicated, and we're looking to take this project through to the completion of a full feasibility study by the end of this year. This is a quick summary of, of what the PEA that we came out with in, 20, in May of this year looks like. It was based on a 4 million ounce inferred resource, which we announced in January. And what it, we're looking at here is a large scale uh, open pit project, uh, very typical in many ways of, of the Beremian, of the rocks in West Africa. Uh, large scale, uh, producing in excess of 200,000 ounces uh, per annum over a 15 year mine life. Low cost um, due to economies of scale primarily, and with significant leverage to the gold price. Um, we view this project in terms of how we operate. As I said, we've been responsible for, cons for construction and operating gold mines uh, throughout Africa in our careers. I've spent uh, close to 30, 30 years of my career exploring, developing, and working on gold mines in Africa. So we very much view this uh, as something that we're going to take through and build. We use a very conservative strategy in terms of how we approach this. Um, this is not a promote on a resource. This is really looking forward to taking this uh, from exploration through development into construction and ultimately into production. Obviously, along the way, if, if something happens from a corporate point of view, we'll obviously be very well aligned with our shareholders um, because with the likes of Lucas Lundin, Ross Beatty and management heavily involved, um, we are ourselves shareholders. You can see the share price graph there. Uh, undervalued, I think, at the moment. Obviously, some headwinds in the gold space at the moment, um, but also some selling. We've had some of the IPO buyers selling over the period, which has really depressed the, the share price. Uh, but I would see this as a significant opportunity, given the scale of this resource, the location and the potential upside. Uh, I really see this as an opportunity for the company uh, or for investors to, to uh, get in at a good level um, and uh, take um, take advantage of the upside that I think this project contains. A quick summary of the, uh, of the shareholding, it's very simple, um, but just over 100,000 shares outstanding, a market cap of about 70 million Canadian. Um, and as you can see at the bottom there, we're significantly owned by Orca Gold. This was a spin out uh, of Orca Gold, which is effectively run by the same management um, with the same backers of Lucas and, and Ross and people like that involved. Uh, and obviously Sandstorm, you can see they're involved as well. Management, um, again, very much a group that has done it before in West Africa. Uh, Kevin Ross, uh, who is on, on part of our Chief Operating Officer, uh, was Chief, Offer Chief Operating Officer of Redback, um, built many mines across the world. Adam Spencer works on the development side, on the corporate side, um, coming from a, a royalty background with Sandstorm. And on the board, uh, significant independence, uh, obviously David Field uh, coming from um, 
portfolio management, Peter Mitchell, the next CFO. Alessandro also worked with us at Redback and obviously Rick Clark, who is the uh, our chairman, is also the chief executive of, of Orca Gold. So as I said, a management team that is really knows Africa very well, has been here a long time uh, and knows how to develop and take assets forward. As I said, located in Cote d'Ivoire, we're focused there. Um, this is a part of the world that I think is probably, I think Cote d'Ivoire is probably the most prospective country in West Africa. It's an easy place to work, politically very stable, uh, following the, uh, the presidential elections in October last year. Uh, and there are mines being built. Perseus has just constructed the Yoare mine in the central part of the country. Uh, Iti uh, has been expanded by Endeavour. Um, so an easy place to work, laboratories, drill rigs, uh, and also a place we can work year round. I think despite the share price uh, performance, we've, what we've really tried to do is, is follow through on what we said uh, we were gonna do. And that's, that's an important part of how we work. Um, this is a, we basically take great pride in delivering what we said we're going to deliver. And I think you can see on the left there, pretty much everything we said and when we listed the company back in October 2020, we have delivered. We've taken the resource from 1.5 million ounces. We've turned it into a 4 million ounce inferred resource. Uh, we've completed a PEA, uh, which has delivered some significant economics on the back of that inferred resource. We've converted more than 100% of that inferred resource into an indicated resource, delivered it to the feasibility study, um, and we are on track to have the feasibility study completed by the end of this year. And looking really uh, in an ideal world to have this project fully permitted and ready to build uh, by the end of Q2 in 2022. So where does it work? Uh, it is a relatively low grade deposit. Uh, the head grade for the, the in the PEA and pit resources uh, around 3.5, uh, sorry, 3.4 million ounces, grading 0.65. Um, and you might think that grade is low, but Grade is not the only king. People say grade is king, but there's an awful lot of other suitors that contribute to turning a discovery into a mine. And that's the key. In some ways, it's harder to take a discovery and turn it into a mine than it is, than it is to actually make that discovery in the first place. So Coney shares a number of features which make it ideal for an open pit. It is up to 200 meters in true width. It dips, as you can see, to the west at about 40 degrees. This is a large scale project with a large scale CIL plant. It's not a heap leach, but that gives us economies of scale in terms of process cost, which drives the cutoff grade down, which means our strip ratio is very low. Uh, the rock is very competent, which means the walls of the pit can be relatively steep. And most importantly, the rock, you know, the mineralization is relatively soft in comparison to other gold deposits. And all of those things uh, contribute to cost. It's all a question of, how much does it cost to mine? How much waste do you have to move? How much does it cost to grind that ore down in order to extract the cyanide? So all of those geological factors contribute to delivering a very large, low cost gold operation. A little bit more detail, I won't dwell on this. This is the detail from the PEA, but as you can see on the left there, the production profile, um, this gives us an average of about 200, just under 250,000 ounces for the first nine years of the mine life. Uh, we are going to mine at a faster rate, and then we will stockpile the low grade material. And at the end of the mining period in year nine, uh, you can see on the left there, uh, we will process stockpiles for the remainder of the mine life, unless other mineralization has been found to be able to displace that. As you can see, low capex, uh, sorry, significant capex. $425 million, excluding contingency, but a low cost base, especially in those first three years with an all-in sustaining cost of 835, um, which delivers a payback of under three years, which was a significant uh, aim of ours in delivering this PEA. One of the aspects we're looking at here is, is the um, power plant. We'll be using an environmentally friendly, low cost, reliable, uh, power plant utilizing liquid, liquid liquefied natural gas in combination with a solar plant. Um, that gives us, you know, obviously it's more environmentally friendly than uh, using HFO or diesel. It also delivers low cost, importantly. Uh, and by putting it on a contract, a boot contract, which effectively 
takes that upfront capital away and puts it into sustaining capital, reduces the cost impact on the project. I've touched on this previously, um, but these are the two key factors. These are the two things that make this work. One of the lowest rock hardnesses that you'd find, which means it costs less to grind the ore, um, which basically reduces the process cost and increases your margin. Less waste to mine, one of the lowest strip ratios you can see in West Africa as well. Less waste to mine means um, less mining cost, which means more margin as well. So these are key things that contribute towards uh, the economics and the strong performance of the project that we see ahead of us. The feasibility study, which is in progress at the moment, is confirming the inputs from the PEA uh, from May. Uh, the rock hardness has been confirmed. Um, we're in the process of doing the mining study at the moment, and the, the, we don't expect the, uh, the strip ratio to change either. As I said, significant conversion of the inferred resource in a lot of projects you'll see. It's often a little bit dodgy when you go from an inferred to an indicated resource, but the nature of the mineralization of Kone and also the conservative approach that we take to it, to modeling it, uh, means that we got a more than 100% conversion of that inferred resource. And at the higher grades in the bottom right here, you can see just marginal increase in the size of the higher grade component. And by mining at an elevated rate, we're able to bring that higher grade component through in the early years of the mining life. Uh, and that's what drives the economics. Good place to work. It's an easy place to operate, as you can see on the slide. And um, there's not a lot of habitation. We don't have to move a significant uh, amount of people here. It's really just crop compensation uh, for, for, for in this area, they grow a lot of cashew nuts and other subsistence agriculture. Um, as you can see a rough layout of the project. We are looking at some alternatives here as part of the feasibility study. We may be able to reduce the size of the tailings uh, and put some of the tailings in the pit, uh, but that's ongoing as part of the feasibility study. We, when we started Montage, when we listed back in October, the, the strategy was very much uh, in two phases. The first phase was to demonstrate that Kone was a strong project on its own. And I think the, the PEA and the feasibility study that's going on at the moment uh, has and will demonstrate that. And obviously producing a significant, significant amount of gold over a significant mine life, 200,000 ounces a year over 15 years. The thing that's gonna change this project uh, and the thing that excites me as an exploration geologist is really looking at the district potential and the potential and the idea of being able to explore for smaller, uh, lower, uh, sorry, higher grade satellite deposits, which can feed in by trucking that ore into the Kone project. Um, when you look at small, uh, small targets outside a major deposit like Kone, you no longer need to look for a million ounces. 50,000 ounces, 100,000 ounces at two grams have a significant e economic impact on the project. So as we go forward, as the feasibility study and permitting continues in the background, our aim now that we've delivered the resource is to send the geologists out, both in the land that we hold, uh, the Kone permit you can see here, a newly uh, granted permit up at Faradugu, and two other applications that we're pushing to get granted, uh, to send the geologists out, and to look for small, look for these satellite deposits. And this really is what's gonna change the project uh, from a very solid looking project to something that is that's uh, firmly in the tier two category. Now looking, if we can find say 500,000 ounces at a couple of grams in a number of satellite deposits, you start to look at this project delivering 300,000 ounces or having the potential to deliver 300,000 ounces over a 10 year mine life, which changes things significantly and improves already good economics even more as we go forward into the future. So this is the key for the project for me. Obviously there's a lot of ground in the middle here which is held by other companies. We're working in the background to try and consolidate some of that. Um, and if we can do that, uh, this project changes considerably. And looking back at that valuation that I showed you in terms of the share price at the beginning of the presentation, I like to think that this exploration, not just the, the value of Kone itself, uh, but the exploration that we have ahead of ourselves um, offers a significant opportunity to, to make a major change to that share price. As I said, the project is moving forward in the background. We're looking towards completion of uh, having a fully permitted project by the middle of next year. Um, so moving quickly, 
Um, but Cote d'Ivoire is a place where you can do that. Permitting is a well-worn path. People know how to do it. The mining code is very clear. Uh, and we also get a huge amount of support uh, from the local people, uh, which makes it a, makes a big difference in trying to push this forward towards development. A little bit one more slide on the uh, on the valuation: ten dollars a reserve a resource ounce in pit at the moment. Uh, relative to our peers, we believe this is a this has a significant potential to to re-rate as we move the project forward. And I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Here we got a few questions here. The first one coming from the Chinese side here is asking, uh, uh, his name is Joe Hui, and he's asking, uh, when we put you on the spot here, what's the most um, attractive thing, or one or two points of the company to investors? Maybe you can summarize, just give us one or two really points that stands out uh, your company. I think the two significant things are Firstly, the scale of the project, uh, the scale of the production. Uh, there are not many pro projects in Africa uh, and perhaps you know, in, a, in the wider world which can deliver plus 200,000 ounces over two, over 15 year mine life. So that scale of production has to be uh, attractive to larger companies from a corporate point of view. And I, say, I think the second thing that, that is most attractive to me is, is that exploration upside. Uh, that has the potential to, to, to change this project significantly as we go into the next year so the next question coming from kiki here uh she's asking what are the main challenges in working in Cote d'ivoire the main challenge is working in Cote d'ivoire um i don't really think there are significant challenges i mean obviously you know africa is sort of perceived to be a place with more political risk uh Cote d'Ivoire, i think is one of the more stable areas uh, this is an area where we can work year round. We have an asphalt road running through the project, which makes access very easy. The government is extremely supportive. The people, local people are very supportive. We can access all the services that we, we require. And the permitting pathway is well known. I think you know, taking a project from PEA uh, to fully permitted in, in probably 14 months, which is what we're looking to do. Uh, I'm not sure you can do that in many parts of the world. So um i think it's actually a very nice place to work so i'm not sure i'm sure there will be challenges but i can't think of any big ones at the moment so one last question here from craig here what's what's sort of the timeline again for monashko to start uh, producing pour and go well um obviously there's a significant capex number there um but if everything you know, we'd like to say you know we'll start working on the on the financing and the different options for financing in the early part of next year We'd like to get a permitted project ready to make a decision by the middle of next year. Uh, it would be a two-year build. Um, so what's that, 22, 20, sometime ideally before the end of 2024 would be a perfect target um, subject to financing. Thank you for addressing all the questions here. Here, well, I'll let you go. Thank you for joining us here today. No, my pleasure, Gilbert. Thanks for having me.